Whether history is written by the victors, toned down for classrooms, or simplified to make a good story, many of the world's most indelible moments have bent, or straight up broken, the truth. Stay with us for the 10 fibs your history teachers have told you for years. On the Mount Rushmore of the most famous short figures in history, alongside Muggsy Bogues, Danny DeVito, and Charlie Chaplin, is French military commander Napoleon Bonaparte, who seized control over most of Europe in less than 10 years. His small stature and hot temper inspired the term Napoleon complex, the belief that short men compensate for their height through aggression. In English, the phrase Napoleon complex directly translates to, I just bought a truck with really big wheels and a really big engine. Hey! Turns out though, that Napoleon was tall enough for his ride across the continent, measuring in at around five foot five, just a shade shorter than the national average at the time, which was five six. The legend of Napoleon being small originated from British cartoonist James Gilray. One of his caricatures depicts a tiny Napoleon in boots that are way too big for him, tearing out his hair in rage, surrounded by furniture that's as big as he is. Gilray continued to depict him as a little child throwing a temper tantrum, and the cartoons became so popular and influential that even Napoleon reportedly said that Gilray did more than all the armies of Europe to bring me down. Not a small accomplishment. Ponce de Leon was the first, third, and seventh governor of Puerto Rico. Talk about an overachiever. According to popular legend, he set sail from Puerto Rico searching for the fountain of youth, but he was instead actually the first European to discover something even crazier, Florida. Stories of vitality restoring waters were known on both sides of the Atlantic long before Ponce de Leon, and the legend of his searching for them was not attached to him until after his death. In reality, he was commissioned by the King of Spain to do what all other explorers were looking for at the time, search for new land to govern and on which to spread Christianity. So while he did not discover or set out to find the Fountain of Youth, at least Ponce will live on in our hearts forever as the man who gave Florida its name. And its reputation as the hub for the most insane news stories in the country was discovered in the 1990s. Our national story about the end of slavery has quite an asterisk next to it. Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863 was really just the beginning. The freedom Lincoln promised applied only to the rebellious states and depended entirely upon the Union's military victory, which came years later. It wasn't until June 19, 1865, months after Robert E. Lee's surrender, that Union armies arrived in Galveston, Texas to inform the enslaved African Americans there that the Civil War was over and they were free. Even still, their freedom was not guaranteed until December 6, 1865, when the 13th Amendment was ratified, legally abolishing slavery in the United States, except as punishment for a crime. Today, we honor June 19th, or Juneteenth, as an annual holiday commemorating the true end of slavery in the U.S. In a rare case of reality being somewhat less gruesome than the accepted folklore, the burning of witches was not an American story. The Salem Witch Trials of 1692 were sparked by a group of girls consumed by alarming fits, their bodies seizing and letting out spine-chilling screams. Back then, a doctor diagnosed them as victims of black magic. Rumors swirled and allegations of witchcraft spread like wildfire. It's typically believed that these witches were burned at the stake, but that is not true. By the end of the crazed witch trials, 20 people were executed in much more traditional ways like hanging, and one man who was pressed to death, similar to applesauce, which is why witches and apples are associated with each other. Uh, that last part isn't true, except someone really did get pressed to death. Yikes. The practice of burning witches at the stake stemmed from the witch trials in Europe between the 15th and 18th centuries. Medieval law codes punished witchcraft by fire, believing that burning the bodies would protect against post-mortem sorcery, a particularly brutal practice that never emigrated to the New World. Stories of American invention are often cast as flashes of brilliant genius, but as Drake says, took 10 years to be an overnight celebrity. For example, we learned at our grade school science fairs that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb in 1879, but in fact, people had been making light bulbs since 1761. 
Other inventors had even patented various versions of light bulbs. Edison, however, was the one who devised the best way to make home lighting practical and affordable. Like when you suggest getting brunch, but someone else suggests a different restaurant and takes all the credit for making the plan. Beyond his technology, though, Edison's greatest invention may have been the modern process of research and development, assembling a team of scientists and engineers at his invention factory in New Jersey. This model has since driven large-scale innovation at corporations, governments, and universities around the world. Thomas Edison, inventor of the light bulb and teamwork. For Americans, July 4th represents freedom, fireworks, and backyard barbecues. But you should actually be lighting your sparklers on July 2nd, which is America's real birthday. The vote for independence actually happened on July 2nd, 1776, not July 4th. On June 7th, the Continental Congress met in Philadelphia, where Delegate Richard Henry Lee introduced a motion calling for the colony's independence. Congress postponed the vote because it was the first summer Friday of the season and they wanted to beat the traffic. However, five men were appointed, including Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin, to draft a justification for cutting ties with Britain. On July 2nd, the Continental Congress reconvened and voted in favor of independence in an almost unanimous vote. That day, John Adams wrote to his wife Abigail that July 2nd would forever be celebrated as the Great Anniversary Festival. Technically, Congress formally adopted the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, but John Adams was so adamant that July 2nd was the correct date, he rejected invitations to attend 4th of July events in protest. Speaking of holidays, who doesn't love Thanksgiving? Turkey, stuffing, pie, your little cousin trying alcohol for the first time? But turns out, pretty much everything we learned about Thanksgiving is, you guessed it, wrong. We're taught that the Pilgrims and the Native Americans came together to share a beautiful feast in 1621, marking the beginning of a great friendship. Well, uh, not so much. There's no evidence that a benevolent relationship existed between the Pilgrims and the Native Americans. If anything, the Pilgrims' strict religion would have made them believe that the indigenous population were under demonic influence, which just kills the appetite. And as part of their Puritan culture, it's more likely they would have fasted in celebration rather than feasted, an elaborate but effective way to avoid eating that one ant's terrible cooking. Thanksgiving wasn't even officially declared a national holiday until 1863, after a writer sent a letter to Abraham Lincoln pleading with him to make it an official holiday for the sake of unifying the nation. In our history books, we're taught that Squanto helped the pilgrims and taught them how to plant maize, but what's left out is the fact that before that, he was captured by the English in 1614, sold into slavery, and returned to New England in 1619 to find his entire tribe had been killed from smallpox, all before he even made contact with the pilgrims in 1621. Driving around North Carolina, you may notice that signs and license plates boast that the state was first in flight or the birthplace of aviation. Contrary to the seemingly common knowledge that the Wright brothers were first to fly an airplane in 1903, there is major controversy over their and North Carolina's claim. If you ask someone in Brazil who the first in flight was, they'll tell you about Alberto Santos Dumont, who piloted a dirigible, uh, bless me, around the Eiffel Tower. And on October 23, 1906, Alberto flew his biplane for about 200 feet at a height of around 15 feet in front. Three weeks later, he set the first world record recognized by the Fédération Aeronautique Internationale for flying 726 feet in his aircraft. Critics of the Wright brothers claim that Santos Dumont was the first powered flight because his aircraft took off unassisted, while the Wright flyer had to be launched off a rail and was assisted by strong winds. Others argue that Gustav Whitehead, a German immigrant in Connecticut, beat out the Wright brothers by flying one and a half miles 150 feet over Bridgeport more than two years before the Wright brothers. A lack of documentation and only two eyewitnesses made the claim difficult to believe, but after a snapshot of Whitehead in flight was found in 2013, Connecticut passed a bill declaring their state first in flight. We know to Victor go the spoils, and it also seems to the loudest goes the credit. Next up, we're dropping in on one of the most iconic legends of every science textbook. Isaac Newton sitting under a tree, getting bonked on the head by an apple, and somehow coming up with the law of gravity. 
It appears an apple was involved, but there's no evidence that the fruit actually landed on his head. While at home on break from Cambridge University, Newton witnessed an apple fall from a tree. Why did it drop straight to the ground, he wondered. Why not go sideways or even upwards? Also, was that tobacco I just smoked? This prompted him to develop his law of universal gravitation. Fun fact, Newton's famous apple tree is still growing at Woolsthorpe Manor. You might want to keep your eyes peeled for any falling objects. If you learned about European history in school, congrats on making it to college. At some point in that class, you would have learned about the French Revolution and Marie Antoinette's famous quote, let them eat cake. For two centuries, the quote has been attributed to Queen Marie as her response for learning that her subjects were starving and couldn't even afford bread. It represented her frivolous disregard for the starving peasants and her poor understanding of their plight. But au contraire, mes amis, the phrase first appeared in a book by French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau in 1767, eight years before Ms. Antoinette became queen. Historians believe he was referencing Marie Thérèse, a Spanish princess at the time of the book's publishing. In addition, the French phrase literally translates to let them eat brioche, not cake. Brioche, aka the bun McDonald's uses for their fancy burger, which costs $3 extra, Unfortunately for Marie, whether she said it or not, the French revolutionaries believed she felt that way about them, ultimately leading to her execution by way of beheading in 1793. Moral of the story? Less carbs, more veggies, and lean proteins, people. So what have we learned, or really unlearned, that there is more than one story to every moment in history? And it's not as simple as a true or false. Unless the question is, is history complicated? Because then the answer is true.